Hey everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Andrew. I am vicar of an amazing church community, St. Peter's in Ruddington, just outside Nottingham. And welcome. Welcome to our next St. Peter's Sunday video, this one for Sunday the 10th of May. I do pray that you're keeping safe and well. So, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to our church building. The bishop said that we could uh, do some videoing from our building, so I rushed here. Here it is. It's still there, uh, waiting for you to come back. The passage set for the Church of England for us to explore today comes from the Gospel of John. It's John 14, verses 1 to 14, and these are some of the most familiar words in the whole of the New Testament. Certainly, of all the passages in the Bible, this is probably the one that I say most regularly because it's so popular at funerals. It goes like this. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? even after I've been among you such a long time. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believing when I say I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glor glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the words, these are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So may I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we have a real treat, for over there there was a passage designed to help us at a time of fear, confusion and uncertainty, just like we're going through now, it's this one. For these are the very circumstances in which these words came about. It was to answer, to respond to a time of crisis that Jesus said these words in the first place. You see, if we jump back in John to chapters 12 and 13, the chapters immediately prior to today's reading, You'll see that not only has Jesus told his friends, his disciples, again that he's going to die, but he's also shocked them to the core by revealing that it's Judas, yeah, Judas Iscariot, who's going to betray him. And then Peter, I know, Peter, the lead disciple, who's going to deny to abandon Jesus. And as a result, they're all left reeling, shaken and confused. So what does Jesus do? Well, Typical of him, even though it's him who's about to be tortured, he who's going to experience all this pain and horror, it is Jesus who takes time to comfort his disciples. And he comforts them in three, three ways. First, he sets this horror, the impending horror of his own torture and murder, and the destruction of all the disciples' hopes and dreams, into the real bigger picture, the context of eternity. And secondly, he reminds them of who he truly is, that he's God in flesh and blood. Verse 10, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. A reality that they glimpse so often in the amazing works, the amazing miracles that he's performed. And by saying this, by underlining this, Jesus reveals his authority, how he can say this stuff and why we should believe and trust in him. And thirdly, finally, despite what is gonna happen, Jesus declares something astonishing that despite what is going to happen, they will never lose their closeness to him, that intimacy that they so valued as they walked with Jesus every day. That's what that often puzzled over verse 14 is about. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. You see, that's what they had before. 
as they wander with Jesus down the road. And they would sidle up to him and say, hey, master, what about? Yeah, Jesus would say, let's go for it. Well, that's what they had now. And Jesus reassures them, they would always have it. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. I love what Professor Barclay, who was former professor of divinity and biblical criticism at Glasgow University, once wrote about this passage. He said, there comes a time when we have to believe where we cannot prove and to accept where we cannot understand. If, even in the darkest hour, we believe that somehow there is purpose in life, that there is purpose in love, even the unbearable becomes bearable, and even in the darkness there is a glimmer of light. And this is what we have here. We have Jesus, and this changes everything, and not just for the future, for now as we measure, as we gain perspective upon what we experience now in the light of the future. So let's do this. Let's grab this greater ultimate reality with both hands. Just as a young person holds the freedom they'll experience after their exams as they knuckle down to the revision that they've still got to do. Or like the athlete who can almost taste the gold medal that they're going to get as they get up once again for that early morning training session. My friends, we have this real hope in Christ. Now, sadly, when it comes to Jesus' words, I think that familiarity, whilst it hasn't bred contempt, does mean that we've lost the shock, the jaw-dropping force of his encouragement. So let me share with you another imagining of heaven, this, the life after this life. It was written by David Lawrence, and it's entitled George's Tale. It had all happened so quickly that now no one could decide with any degree of certainty exactly what had taken place. Stories circulated of a smoky darkness penetrated by lightning flashes so bright and so frequent that the night had turned to day. Of earthquakes so powerful that it seemed as if nothing could remain standing. Of a gale, a terrible restless gale that seemed to sweep away everything that the earthquake had pulled down. Others, whilst unable to remember any phenomena, could quite clearly recall an experience within themselves, a kind of purging to the very core of their being. Others still, rendered half insensible by the experience, spoke wistfully of a sudden overwhelming presence of Jesus himself, greeting them in a tone so friendly and welcoming that the very act of hearing him had been a form of healing. To be honest, none of these people could really describe, much less explain what had happened. They just knew that whatever it was, they were different now, that everything was different now. Memories of the life that was were already becoming distant. It was consequently difficult to contrast the life that was with this one in any detail. But as George surveyed the scene, before him he knew deep inside that this was not how life had always been. From this vantage point, perched on the parapet of the bridge over the river, he watched a group of people of men and women cavorting in sheer unrestrained happiness. Staccato snatches of conversation carried to his ears. Never thought I'd see you again. Missed you so much. Make up for lost years. Separated by what he, what he knew not, uh, George watched their delight as each took turns to hug, to laugh and to dance with each other. Their joy was punctuated by shouts of thank you Jesus and praise the maker. Their ordinary conversation and their worship blending into one natural flow of communication. George, caught up in the sheer exuberance of their merrymaking, found himself laughing as he turned to look at another group further away. This group was standing silently, as still as statues, arms around one another's shoulders, not speaking, totally absorbed in being bound together. One was black skin, the other white. One was wearing the habit of a Catholic nun, and she was bound tightly to another wearing the skull cap of a Jew. Completing the circle was a Palestinian woman who, it seemed to George, held on to the Jew with deeply felt tenderness. This knot of people in their silent unity spoke as eloquently as had the first group with their hilarity. It was as if, in the very act of hugging and holding, something healing was happening reuniting something that had been fractured, 
None of them can say what it was. They just knew that standing thus, it was in itself an important expression of who they had become and why they were here. The sight was so beautiful that George had difficulty looking away, but out of the corner of his eye, his attention was drawn to two familiar figures coming along the road. He looked and looked again. Yes, there was no doubt. The woman on the right was Diane, his wife in the life that was. He, he jumped from the bridge and ran along the road to greet her. Now, George had always thought that Diane was attractive, but now, in this light, she seemed more beautiful than ever. As he came closer towards her, he became more aware of the man walking at her side, a man George had never seen before, yet, strangely, he instantly recognised as his son, Michael. The sight of Michael caused George to pause, confused and overwhelmed. What had happened? Michael had himself been born in the life that was with a disability, which had meant that Diane had to carry him everywhere. His legs had been crooked and incapable of bearing his weight, and he had suffered from a breathing disorder, which made even the least exertion totally exhausting. George still remembered, although even the strongest of memories was fading fast, how Diane's life had been totally dedicated to carrying him and washing him and feeding him. He could do nothing for himself, for he had not lived past ten years of age. Now here he was, strong, a strong adult, holding his mother so tightly that he was almost carrying her. They were both wrapped up in each other's company so much that at first they didn't see George. But as soon as they became aware he was there, Michael ran to him and threw himself into his arms. Diane joined them in the embrace which like the hugs of the silent group that George had just been watching, seemed to right a world of wrongs, and at the same time, mark both the end and the beginning of an era. Do not let your hearts be troubled, for what is the worst that could happen now that we know the bigger picture, the reality of the life beyond this life? And why? Well, Jesus explains, because he is God in flesh and blood, Jesus, who will never withdraw from us, not now or for all eternity. And all of this shall give us courage now to live, to spend our lives now recklessly loving God and neighbour. For if this is what awaits us, and it does, we'd be fools not to live lives of extravagant love now, wouldn't we? Amen. So let us pray. First, I'd like to pray for all of us. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick. And lift up all who are brought low, that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Now let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. So let's say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. If I can help at all, you know where I live. Or drop me an email. Uh, give, me a, give me a call. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. So let me end with a blessing. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. God bless everyone. Bye-bye.